My name is Jill Heinerth and I'm an underwater explorer. My job is to go into blackness, a place completely void of light, and make art. I think of myself as swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. I'm swimming in the lifeblood of our planet. Our Earth is not just lakes, rivers, and oceans, but it's this vast network of groundwater that knits us all together, and it's a shared resource from which we all drink. When Margaret Tolbert first reached out to me about Aquafarius, I was honored to participate. Collaborations are, are what expose people to new and interesting things they never considered before. So artists, photographers, divers, surveyors, environmentalists, advocates together can unite an audience through adventure and beauty and sport to think about our underwater resources. So I'm really proud to be an Aquafarian. They are so much like another world, it's especially when you consider how different they look from the surface before you enter. And then, you know, things look kind of small and a, a diver inside looks like a twisted scrap of paper. Things look sort of small and warped. And then you enter the springs and it's like this face is violently blown apart. Light seems to come from all directions at once. And there are these, there are these water plants blown in a, a soundless wind and everything is tinged with a rainbow spectrum of color. So it really is like you stepped into another universe. I'm relatively new to the city of Gainesville. I'd been here about, I guess, two and a half years at the time and sheepishly admitted to a friend of mine, a photographer who has photographed many of Margaret's pieces, that I had never been in the Springs. And he said, well, there's only one person to show you the Springs, and that's Margaret Tolbert. And so I called her up and she said, what are you doing tomorrow? And within 24 hours, I was diving in the amazing waters of Gilchrist Blue Springs and never the same. Just as the springs present a lens to us to view the world in this most felicitous of experiences in this state where we can actually be in the water and we can look out and we can see the world from another place. And as the springs gives us that lens, so are there many lenses for looking at the springs. Mine happens to be, sometimes it's writing and sometimes it's, it's painting and my, the immersion. There's a famous quote by Isadora Duncan that says something like, if I, if I could say something through words, I would, but instead I dance it because that's the way I communicate it. So when I think about architecture, I think that it, it, it embodies its own form of knowledge. And in a similar way, I think that the work that Margaret does communicates information and studies the world in a different way that can best be studied through the work that she does, paintings and um, the other kind of forms of artistic production she does. I think, I think she's the muse. I think she is the actual muse. Yeah, that, that's how I view her. I, I was so inspired when she walked, just when she walked in the door, I felt it, it was like bam. Margaret met Eric, I don't exactly know how, but Eric, met, she saw a picture that we had taken of, of Awesome Pit and Silver Glen Springs. And Eric was really the biggest part of that photograph. He, 
he was the guy swimming around with the strobe. I sat behind the camera with the lens open for 30 minutes. You know, this was in uh, 1990, I guess, so it was old camera technology and cameras didn't do what they can do now, so he had to make the camera stay open for the 20 minute exposure. So that was his job, but he, he used a uh, old wooden clothes pen and it held the camera wide open and he just sat there and watched. I actually fell asleep. So I get credit for the photo, but Eric did all the work. <laughs> you know, to take pictures in underwater caves, it, that's, that's probably the most difficult kind of pictures that I can think of because you know, all the problems associated with cave diving, the photography part is like dressing a whole other diver with, with no input from them whatsoever. It's, it's kind of actually a miracle when you get like a couple of divers and you get all this camera gear, all these strobes, and you go back into an underwater cave and everything works and you get good pictures. I think that each time you abandon yourself to this intense discovery and study and any kind of creation about it, then it's, it's, it's art. In the Aquafaria show that we had at Virginia, um, one of the, the drawings was the, uh, the cross-section of Silver Glen Springs by uh, Margaret's collaborator, Eric. And um, it, that's an incredibly beautiful drawing of something that seems impossible to draw, and he does it incredibly well and with a kind of precision I wouldn't have imagined. But for me, the whole concept of drawing something that's so irregular where there's no horizon, there's no true vertical is, it's kind of magical because it's, it's so, so much in opposition to everything that I understand about how we understand space in the world. It, it started at a very young age, crawling around in caves and as, as I was in them, I would see all the geology and how it is sculpted and turned and twisted and if you really get in there you'll see it you you know like you go outside and you look up at the cloud and you go oh look at that cloud looks like a poodle or a chihuahua or whatever you'll be crawling through these caves and this big rock uh, outcropping will look like a bear or a, a tree there's no one way to see the springs there's no one way to understand this experience it's everything is valid it's like the science about the springs is a way to see the springs but you have to, at the same time, consider all these different things, and they're all yes. They're all about the springs. Biology is great stuff. I, I can't get enough of it. That and geology. I, I love the both of them. They're the earth sciences, right? The, the biological sciences. And oh, I'm kind of broad. I'm a generalist, and my my, my training over at the University of Florida was was kind of that way. They kind of encouraged some us to be generalists, to always think of that next bigger system, right? That's kind of the way ecologists think. If you're studying one thing, you want to look at the system that's bigger than that. You don't just look at the watch, you look at the watchmaker. There's a big spring up here, and it's, it's not very well known, but it's the most upstream spring on the Santa Fe River. Above here, that groundwater influence is, uh, is no longer felt. There's no more springs. You can tell how high the water gets. The cypress trees tend to take a, a stain when the water floods up and leaves a nice little bathtub ring, a little high water mark. Or you go about three quarters, two thirds of the way up the um, swollen part of the trunk and that's typically um, mean high water. Also, you can look at the cypress knees. Cypress trees live in, in saturated soils. There's very little, if any, oxygen down in those, in, those, in those soils, those flooded soils. And they need oxygen just like we do. So they figure that's for gas exchange. Cypress trees are, are considered to be obligate wetland plants, meaning they're, you won't find them anywhere but in a wetland. We talk about a lot about aquifers. And of course, here in Florida, the great Florida aquifer, one of the great aquifers of the world. And all an aquifer really is, is a, a geologic formation that has space in it to hold water. It can be gravel, it can be sand. In the case of Florida, um, our main aquifer is a limestone aquifer.
we can see lime rock over here at the surface. That's really kind of the, the top of the aquifer. Boy, look at all this rock along here. There's a royal fern. That's a wetland fern. Another one that you, it's an obligate. It's obliged to live in the wetlands. Here we are. They're calling this Santa Fe Springs. We used to call it Columbia Springs, but there's another one further down they call Columbia Spring, which isn't even a spring. It's a swallette and then up again. So I think they've taken the call on this Santa Fe Spring. When there's a big drought and the Santa Fe River quits flowing above the spring, the entire flow of the river is coming out of the spring. We're more, much more interested in something to go explore. I mean, the beauty is, is great. But the exploration is great also. Toilet with a view. <laughs> the science is just as beautiful as the or the images or the paintings. The the concepts are the concepts are beautiful. And just knowing how things work, just kind of understanding what's out there, gives you a much greater appreciation of, you know, just knowing the names of things. That's a real important thing for people. It's kind of like once you get to know people, you can walk into a room of strangers, you're isolated from them, and, but once you know their names and a little bit about them, you're no longer isolated, you're part of the group. Okay, it's a little different now than yeah. what the single tank stuff and. Artifact. He's an artifact? Oh, yeah. My first reel. I made that. Nice. Yeah, look at it. It's nice. It had a wooden handle like a pistol grip, and yeah. like later I, yeah. I took that off and put that on. But there it is. That's pretty good. Yeah, it, it still works. Yeah. I keep scrap line on it now. Nice. <laughs> cool. I guess at the beginning um, of the dive, I'll fall. I guess Jim's going to have a, a GoPro too, so he's going to film all of us. Okay. Um, but I'll follow you guys in, I guess. Um, and when we get short of, um, you know, maybe 60, 70 feet short of the drop, uh -huh. stop. Okay. And let me get past you. Okay. And then do the backlit. Uh, if you want to lead and Tom backlight Okay. You, all right. Um, and then just swim right by me on my left hand side and go down the chute just like on that. On your left hand side. And All get right. over top of you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You want us to come over your head or one of those or? Um, no, probably no, not. Just by, no, just no, by, just by you. All right. Yeah, I'll come on your left side. Then. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Make and so sure as I have you do that, just yeah. like swing the lights around. Make sure I have enough room mm -hmm. yeah. to keep backlighting as we go by her. Okay. So you want to backlight with this? Um, mm -hmm. Man, that's, look at how small it is. <laughs> so um, that's like the on-off switch. And then uh, just to, to ramp it up, just bring it up like this. And you'll yeah. see the, the bar graph go all the way up until you see 8,000. Okay, just kind of keep tapping it. Like yeah, it and it'll give you 50 minutes remaining, basically. Mm -hmm. And then 
and then <laughs> wow, I'm off, to look at you, it. you mm-hmm. hold it back yeah. long for off, like two seconds back for off. Like your your charcoal covered pants kind of went boom. Yeah. Your like patches and pockets. <laughs> Big bunch of people for yeah. sure. Sure you that. Okay. Wow! Look at those fins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't miss them. <laughs> They're all in the water and ready to go. And you guys look like I'm a still on land. A walking charm bracelet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a charm bracelet. Yeah. Yeah.
Did you get some nice stuff? Yeah. 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 It's such a pretty cave. It is. Yeah, that 45 degree viewfinder is a dream too. Yeah, I, well, it's the first time I've actually had a chance to look at one of these. When I first met Margaret, I wasn't actually taking pictures underwater. You know, 20 years ago, I didn't think it was really necessary to go out and it never crossed my mind to go out and we should be documenting these springs what, what they are now. Margaret did actually do that. Do that and um, some of her pictures are becoming really valuable now. One of the things that happened was I had been having eureka moments at the spring since the 80s. And I thought, that especially compared to my work about travel and all the man-made edifices that I um, referenced in my work were changing or had seen the changes through history, but the springs never changed, I thought. And they, they were off there somewhere. They were the same for Native Americans, for people 3,000 years before, and for us now. And then I started to see them change in the 90s. All of a sudden they did change and I started to realize that my palette and my paintings had changed slightly without intentionally, but my painting processes started incorporating different colors and forms. And I realized it was algae, the water wasn't as clear. My concept of the energy of a spring was that it was a large and light filled and utterly clear, air clear room that you could enter. And then I started thinking, no, maybe the springs are a force. We entered it as a force. And that's because you started seeing things in the water. You could see the water moving. You could see the beams of light. Stuff was in the water then. So that air clear descent that I used to do in those large paintings is kind of impossible in terms of being inspired by what I'm seeing. There's been an explosion of irrigated agriculture in North Florida. Um, and along with the irrigation comes the fertilizer because the soils they don't hold the fertilizer any better than they hold the water. So it just washes down into the aquifer. And what we have now is landscape level contamination of the aquifer. And by landscape, I mean the entire thing. It's, it's from end to end. And couple that with overpumping of the aquifer, which leads to stagnation in the aquifer and, and um, stagnation in these caves. Um, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. We basically, we need to put limits on irrigated agriculture, fertilizer use, and human population would be kind of nice too, but that ain't gonna happen. But those other two things, we can do that if we want to, and we need to. I'm not trying to be an advocate. I'm an unwilling advocate. I just really wanna celebrate the beauty of the springs. So if I notice it without looking for it, then really something has to happen. Why do we do this? Why am I sitting here in front of this camera? Why am I sitting in front of Margaret's art? Why do we publish our photos and publish our maps to educate people that this is what we have here? A lot of people have been here their whole lives and don't realize. So our job as artists, as producers, as scientists is to get it out there to educate the, the, the general public of exactly what we have and what we're standing on and how fragile it is and what's going good about it, what we love about it, what is beautiful about it, and what's going wrong with it and what could happen. There's a kind of mission that Margaret has. Uh, it's somewhat captured in the title. I think she wants people to go try it for themselves because you can look at the paintings, you can read the books, you can look at the videos, but there is nothing like that experience when you first put your head below the water and you see the crystal blues and purples and greens and all of those colors kind of dazzling in front of you that changes you forever. What are your favorite things about the springs? You can talk about that.